All right, then we had two case studies that were handed out, one for the honors biology kids and one for the AP bio kids. The honors biology went over uh, uh, cell transport, specifically osmosis and diffusion, focusing on osmosis, while the AP biology went over, uh, I think you did the internet, that's on the day that honors did uh, osmosis, AP Bio did uh, international studies. International exchange actually. There's actually an opportunity now for uh, for some students to go to Japan uh, with the program. I'm not sure how that runs, but, and I'm not sure if it's open to high school students, but it's interesting that that could be a place where that program leads down in the future, uh, sometime in the future. <clears throat> okay, so the first part of this video is gonna focus on the osmosis case study, and the second part gonna, uh, is going to focus on the AP Bio's uh, case study, which they did on on Wednesday. This was on osmosis video, what is on Tuesday for the honors biology kids, and AP Bio Biology did their case study on Wednesday. Honors Biology had another case study on Wednesday, I'll create another video at a later time uh, on that case study. Hopefully sometime today. All right, so let's go on then. Oh, what should we focus in and on? Uh, what should we focus on here? <coughs> you submitted these, or you should have submitted. So the idea is that since I've been ill, <clears throat> I've given you an opportunity to submit all late work, right? And as part of that, in class, you are able to... Uh, do most of your work. You have an opportunity today to go over and complete your chapter eight work for honors biology, your chapter eight reading and notes. Just simply reading and taking notes really should not be that <coughs> stressful. At least I hope it isn't. It's been uh, two weeks you guys have had to work on that, including this week. And that's due Monday for sure. Now, I've been thinking over and over again about the lab report. Uh, I know some of you have really worked hard on it, and I want to collect it on, on Monday. Uh, However, I need you to know that even though that's a Monday deadline, I'm, we're going to work on that. I'm going to give you opportunities on, if I feel up to it, um, Monday night, Monday after school, and uh, Wednesday after school, and Thursday after school, my, uh, I will w help uh, anyone who needs help um, with that lab report to make sure it gets turned in and done right. Uh, so this is a soft deadline on uh, of Monday. And so this is gonna be a soft deadline on Monday there for that. I just feel like if anyone needed help, I wasn't there to give it to them, and I I, I don't feel comfortable just accept, just turning it in, just collecting it. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now let me see. So you've, you should have caught up with your 
your work, your chapter eight notes. I gave you a checklist to, uh, today to help you. I gave you a checklist today. Make sure that everybody has is aware of what they need to get done. You should be able to read Schoology and get it done that way. That should not be an issue. But we all have issue. We all have problems sometimes keeping and organizing our work. So make sure that you're doing that. Also, if you cannot upload, please make sure you have your use this time to organize. So you know organize your work. Now, you've had two assignments in honors biology and one assignment in AP biology. You had to participate in national exchange and you had your registration for the learning platform <clears throat> as well as participation notes uh, for the international exchange should have been uploaded. That's fine. Uh, the videos, though, are that I'm making now are to help you, if you in case you want to resubmit your case studies I want to make sure that you've done your work that you've tried your best on your own and then I want to give you the right answers now and allow you to resubmit them to try to get a hundred percent on these case studies make sure you have your understanding straight I want you to check your work I want you to be reflective I want you to revise that's what I'd like to see happen in this next uh, in this next uh, you know I don't know hour. It's only gonna be I don't know how long it's gonna take for the first case study for honors biology. Of course, the honors biology kids don't need to stay for the AP bio case study. AP bio I would suggest you uh, might want to look at, especially if you're a little unsure about osmosis, uh, you should go ahead and use this opportunity to at least skim through the the answers to their case study. I think it's an interesting case study, and I think you would have done well on it. Uh, however, you may want to check your work and make sure that your understanding is on par with expectations. All right, guys, uh, let's get started. All right, here is the first page of the cell transport and plasma membrane structure. We have simple diffusion is defined for you as one of the models. Um, they give you uh, a little paragraph here, which a lot of you guys have actually mentioned in class, Gatorade, Powerade, vitamin water, uh, and what kind of solution it is. Uh, so here's uh, how do substances move in and out of cells. Uh, so they say advertisers for drinks such as these seem to be everywhere. All these drinks are supposed to help your body recover and replenish lost electrolytes, fluids, and vitamins after ex exercise. But how do these essential molecules containing the drinks get into your cells to help you recover after exercise? So your cells have this semi-permeable membrane. We've looked at the structure. I'm not going to go over it here. Just remember they're phospholipid bilayer. There are proteins in, in your membranes. This says semi-permeable. Remember that is the same term that is the same as saying selectively permeable. So make sure that those two terms are the same in your mind. Um, I know that traditionally it's semi-permeable, but what have you, it's selectively permeable. In this case, it's, it is semi-permeable because there's two of them and only one, uh, looks like only one can get through, which is fine. <coughs> How many different types of molecules are shown in model one? Well, I hope that the answer is obvious to everyone that it's, it's two types, right? 
It's a triangle or the circle. Uh, but in the case of a cell, remember, this could be uh, uh, water and this could be sodium ion or chloride ion or glucose or an amino acid or a protein. So these are symbols like variables like in algebra where they represent any number of things. The point is that they're two different types of things. Count and record the number of triangles and circles found on each side of the membrane. Uh, so circles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 circles and on on left and and let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen triangles On right, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 circles. And zero triangles. So <clears throat> if you're doing this lab, this case study, and you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, <clears throat> I know this, I recognize this. There's a selective, selectively permeable membrane or semi-permeable membrane. There's two substances. I got 12 circles on one side and 14 triangles on, the, on that same side. And I have 12 circles on the other and zero triangles on the other. And then for the circles, I have equilibrium, but for the triangles, I have, <clears throat> I have uh, an imbalance. I have a hypertonic side and a hypotonic side when it comes to triangles. If the circles are water and the triangles are solute, then I have a hypertonic solution on the left and a hypotonic on the right. That's one way to look at it. I have a high concentration of triangles on the left and a low concentration of triangles on the right. I have equal concentration. Uh, well, I still have a high concentration of water on the right or circles on the right and a low concentration, a lower uh, of circles on the <coughs> On the, uh, on the left, because here, remember, if we were looking at circles, let's think about that. Circles on the right, how would you describe, before I'm, I haven't even gotten to the questions yet, the second part, but let's think about that. This, uh, this right side is 100% circle. Right? So if we do the math, the left side's about 46% uh, forty six circles as compared to 100% circles on the right. Okay, and then it's 54%, 54% triangles, where 0% triangles on the, <clears throat> on the left. I'm sorry, on the right. So something to think about, even though before I even move into the problem, before I even read any further, already that popped into my head when I saw this. I saw the word simple diffusion, and I'm thinking to myself, simple diffusion, that means that it's just going to go from high to low. There's no extra energy required. I know that semi-permeable, so one of the two semi, meaning half, one of the two things is going to get through, the other one isn't. 
uh, let's go on and see what the case study then ex uh, asked me to do. Which shape is larger? The triangle is larger. So these just seem simple. Describe the direction of movement of the molecules in model one, right? So this is, this is one of those tricky questions. And the reason it's tricky is that they don't tell you anywhere in the problem that the triangle can't get through. The triangle's larger, but is it big enough to get through the semipermeable membrane? Or is it not? Then the next question is, <clears throat> it says describe the movement of molecules in model one. The question is, there's, well, there, there's more than one way to answer that. And so what I would suggest, what I would write if I were trying to write a correct answer is I would say for number one, If the triangles and the circles can move past the mat through the membrane, then the circles would move to the left and the triangles to the right. That's assuming, <clears throat> that's if. So it's an if, uh, then statement, right? So this it depends. It depends if it's if the triangles can move. If the triangles... are too large to move <coughs> then the circles will move to the left. Again, if the triangles are too big, then the circles on their only alone. In either case, movement will occur until equilibrium is reached at which time
movement in both directions. We'll continue. at equal rates. So, <clears throat> so this is talking about dynamic equilibrium. Um, Um, up here, these triangles, we should see mostly, now these two, mostly in one direction. And this would be simple diffusion. So that answers that would be the absolute right answer in my opinion. Um, there's probably ways of improving this, but um, I, you know, what would I? I would expect to see some understanding to the point where you, you should some in some way phrase it so that I understand that you that you understand that if the if the triangles can move, they're going to move toward from high to low. Right, and if the circles can move, they'll move high to low. So that that's important. And if the triangles can't move, then the circles will move. If the triangles can't move, then the circles will move from high to low. So I think that that's that's an important distinction, and I think that the idea that Again, not knowing what they want, I know what I've taught you, so I, I would expect that you'd be able to explain that the movement of the particles are moving in both directions and would continue to move in both directions. It's just that when one side is higher than the other, the movement is mostly in one direction, and that will continue to move in that direction until both sides are about equal, at which time they'll, they'll move in equal ra at equal rates in both directions. All right, which molecules are able to pass to semi promo justify your answer? Well, now I know that what they want, what, I, what they wanted was this, that the triangles can't get through. That's what they were trying to get at. But without stating it, it's important to make sure I have my thinking straight. So what I would have written then for this one would be simply, <clears throat> uh, the larger triangles cannot pass through the membrane. There it is. So, and I think that the, uh, you know, the key word here is again, semi-permeable membrane, uh, larger triangle. Uh, the small circle can. And if I were asked to justify it, if I were asked to really get into it, I might say something like 
size is one of the two major criteria for particles trying to pass through the membrane. The other, the other factor would be <clears throat> charge. And so uh, size is one of the two major criteria for uh, particles trying to pass through the membrane. And of course, you don't know anything about the charge. So uh, triangles can't pass through the membrane. Uh, the larger triangles can't, the smaller particles can. But they, they're asking you to justify your answer which, to me, I don't know why they give you such little space uh, to do such a thing, because how do you justify it in just a sentence, uh, which suggests a, uh, that you need at least a couple sentences or two or three sentences. But just to try to fit it all in, I'd say the larger ones can't pass through the membrane, the smaller ones can. Size is one of the two cri major criteria for particles trying to pass through the membrane. And it's, it's semi-permeable. You, you might have added semi means... Uh, uh, only part or half of the particles can get through. So that might be another clue. Uh, but that would be my, my best answer, given the limited amount of information. If you left this system for an extended period of time and viewed it again, would you expect to find any changes in concentrations of molecules on either side of the membrane justify your answer? Yes, I think you would expect, you know, you wouldn't get, so if you if you drew it out and you knew that you had that here and this here, and I'm not drawing out every, I'm not going to go ahead and put out however many triangles and et cetera. And I know the triangles can't get through. I know that the, the small circles are going to move in that direction in the in the direction of in the direction of the uh, from their high to their low by the way this is a model that suggests the beginnings of the foundations of the or the beginnings of an understanding of the word osmosis right this is foreshadowing osmosis. It's trying to make sure you understand that this is why water moves in, in, in a direction that you wouldn't expect. And the water would move. This would become more dilute. The this side would become more dilute, so it's less concentrated, less concentrated after some time. The left would be less concentrated, right? So it was, it was 54%, about 54% triangle. Now, it'll be a lot less. Let me, re let me rephrase that. After some time, You know what, just to be clear, I don't want anyone just writing something down and then being confused later. What happens is you guys write down what I write and then you don't hear what I'm saying and it becomes confusing later. So let me let me write down exactly what I'm saying that it was 
about 54% so uh, triangles and uh, after some time the left less percent triangle right I mean does that make sense you have more of the circles going towards the left yes you do have some circles going to the right I want to emphasize that it's a smaller arrow but they have a lot of circles going to the left. So the left is going to be less concentrated over time. Where the right, though, is going to stay 100% water. <coughs> the right is going to stay 100% water because the triangles can't get through. That's uh, that would be, again, just trying to remind you that this is kind of the basis of the understanding of osmosis. All right, so let's go on with this selectively permeable. That was a semi. I see that they actually divided semi and selectively permeable. Cell is selectively permeable, where this membrane semi permeable. All right, I can accept that as a as a use. Unfortunately, we both textbooks and <clears throat> and problems will often allow the word semi-permeable to kind of be applied to cell membrane. Some, a cell membrane is, in fact, uh, selectively permeable. All right. So <clears throat> there are components of our cell membrane, as we discussed in the, in the beginning here, small nonpolar uh or small polar molecules here, this little ones like water, right? Like oxygen gas, this little dot, the circles. And then the phospholipids are here. Very, very uh, basic drawing of phospholipids. Small surface proteins uh, are just on the surface, either inner surface, they could be on the outer surface, but they're in the inner surface here. And then and then include, oh no, they, I'm sorry, they're both outer, outer surface proteins and inner ones. Maybe this is blood type A or B, or maybe it's some other kind of uh, molecule that's involved in signaling. Uh, it's going to be difficult for it to be involved in signaling unless it's attached to something else, but some kind of identifier. This protein has some function that is not crossing this L membrane. So remember, that means that it can't be used as a channel, can't be used as a transporter. Uh, sometimes cell surface proteins can be linked to, to uh, proteins that cross the membrane, so they can be associated with proteins that, that act as signals. Uh, but right now, the surface proteins on the outside are stuck on the outside. They cannot send information or, or material through the membrane, and the, and the cell surface proteins on the inside also cannot send information out nor transport things out of the membrane. But right now, they're, the insides are inside surface, cell surface proteins are inside and the outsides are outside. This little branch tree is a carbohydrate chain and this is a, called a glycoprotein. So are your cell surface uh, markers like <coughs> uh, blood type A and B, they're proteins that have glucose chains attached to them, right? So they call them a glycoprotein. We discussed that months ago when we covered biomolecules, but just to remind you that, you know, a carbohydrate chain is C made mostly of CHO and the protein ch uh, amino acid chains can be linked. Uh, through the same process, dehydration synthesis, you can connect the two, right? 
uh, glycoprotein, and then uh, you have a glycolipid, which again, you have a lipid who has uh, this sugar attached to it. So these, these carbohydrate chains can be attached to lipids, they can be attached to sugar, uh, to proteins, and they can act in many different ways. They increase, they increase the, the differentiation, they increase the variety of the molecules that can be on the outside or the inside of a cell, either to use as a identifier or a key or a lock. So they're very, uh, very useful when you think about shape that increases the number of shapes that you can make. <coughs> and remember, shape and function are intricately related. What are the major types of biological molecules composed? What two types of biological molecules compose the majority of the cell membrane in model two? The majority of this is uh, lipids, right? So lipids and I would call, I would say protein, lipids and proteins, right? There are some carbohydrates we just mentioned, but I think it would be fair to say in, the, in general lipids and proteins if I was forced to pick two as it says with two major types. How many different pro uh, protein molecules are found in model two? I mean, different protein molecules. So, well, there's this, cell, there's this outer cell surface protein, that's one. There's an inner cell, cell surface protein, that's two. There's a membrane spanning protein Oh, by the way, this is all, this one is also known as a glycoprotein because it has a uh, glucose. This is one on the outside. There's uh, there's one on the the one on the inside is just a small cell surface protein. Uh, so there's small cell surface proteins, either on the inside or the outside. Do you make a difference? Uh, do you identify them as being different? Let's go ahead and call them that. They have colored them different colors and one set's on the inside, the other set's on the outside. So I'll go one. If you only if you included these two as, as one type, I would be okay with it. So one, two, there's glycoproteins, there's that's three. There's phospholipids. That's, oh, I'm sorry, this asks for proteins, right? So one, two, three glycoproteins, four uh, membrane-spanning uh, protein, <coughs> the dark ones, and membrane-spanning proteins, the lighter ones. So it could be, I, I think there's two possible answers that I think would be would be fair if you included these two, if you just went by this chart, you would include, uh, there'd be one, uh, two, three, or you can say one, two, three, four, five. That would be fair. You could either, you can either choose to separate these and these or lump them as they did in their key. So, uh, you know, depending on how you count them, how you group them, you can do three, or five. All right, either answer I think would be fair. Let's move on. What is the difference between uh, the position of the cell surface protein and the membrane spanning uh, and the membrane spanning proteins? Well, as I alluded to earlier, <coughs> the cell surface proteins are Here, let me just write it out, then I'll talk. So I'm just trying to, there's a lot of different ways you can answer this, but when I'm thinking about osmosis and diffusion, simple diffusion, I'm asking myself, why would they ask this question? Uh, the surface proteins are only on the inside or outside and cannot be used to transport material into or out of the cell. So I, I think that that's pretty much the, the key point here uh, when it comes to this, reducing a lot of this information to, to its, its most essential, I think what you have to realize is that <coughs> these cell surface proteins are on both the inside and the outside of the cell. They can be used for all kinds of different things, but they cannot be used to transport 
they're not channels. They're not protein chan. They're not channels that allow ions through or or glucose through or what have you. When a carbohydrate chain is attached to a protein, what is the structure called? Well, I think we just said it uh, earlier. Glycoprotein. When the carbohydrate is attached to the phospholipid, what's it called? It's a glycolipid, and that's all in the key. <coughs> what type of molecules are shown moving across the membrane? Small, not small, polar, or small, nonpolar. That's all according to the chart. All you had to do is, I mean, all I did was read the chart, read the diagram, and that gave me all those answers. This one, this answer we had discussed in class, so it should have been in your notes from previous days. Where exactly in the membrane does, uh, do the molecules pass through? Uh, I would hope you would say, through the membrane only because you see the arrows if you look go back and look at the diagram you'll see that the arrows go right through the phospholipids they don't need to use uh, they don't need to use channels they don't need to use transmembrane proteins because <clears throat> They're small and nonpolar, or small and polar. How does the concentration of small molecules inside the, the cell compare to, the, to that on the outside of the cell? Well, I think if you look at it, uh, the diagram, you'll see that the outside is higher. Outside is more concentrated. Because particles move randomly, molecules tend to move across the membrane in both directions. Does the model indicate that the molecules are moving in equal amounts in both directions? Justify your answer using complete sentences. So to answer the question, um, does the model indicate molecules are moving uh, in both directions? Justify your answers. The show, model shows more arrows pointing in than pointing out. This suggests that more are moving inward. Uh, that would be enough, I think, uh, to answer their question, which is, you know, uh, why do I think they're moving in more in and out? But I think even a better answer, uh, and I think the best answer is it also include the justification that this makes sense since the concentration is higher outside and random movement would tend to move material from high to low. That that is the expectation that things are gonna move from high to low mostly, right? That the majority of material, even though mater the material is still gonna keep moving in both directions because it is random movement, not some kind of uh, <clears throat> energy-driven selective transport <clears throat> you'd expect the material to move from high to low. All right. The majority of the material to go from high to low. All right, and he says, read this. When there is a difference in concentration of a particular particle on either side of the membrane, a concentration gradient exists. That's an important idea, one that could easily be skipped in your mind if you're reading it. Concentration gradient. Remember, we said in class that when you, uh, in art, you know, they'll ask you to do kind of uh, a shading uh, technique where you start with very dark lines and then uh, then you move on to uh, very light lines so when you when you talk about a gradient you're talking about going for, in art you're talking about going from dark to lightest from darkest to lightest these colors change a little bit uh, but it's the best i can do in short notice uh <clears throat> so the point is that when you're talking about a concentration gradient you're talking about 
going from a lot, right? I should use a darker. You use a lot on one side, then you have less and less and less, and then there less until you move on. And so what what you get is uh, in a concentration grade, you get from highest to lowest. It's not high on one side and low on the other usually it's there's a dispersion pattern a pattern where you go from highest concentration to lowest concentration just like you would from darkest to lightest when you're doing art and you're doing a, a shading exercise particles are moving along the gradient from high to low concentration until a state of equilibrium is reached there's another word that we've, again, already identified, and it's important, uh, but uh, equilibrium is reached. At that point, no more net movement. Now, here's the key, another key word, net movement in one direction. Although particles continue to move randomly on both sides, it, this is often called dynamic equilibrium, which we've already identified as kind of what the whole purpose was. We reduced it down already before we even got to this point. The net movement of particles along concentration is called diffusion. So the movement, the net movement, the movement from high to low <coughs> is diffusion. All right. Look back at models one, two. Which particles are moving by diffusion across the membrane shown? Well, I, I hope that, that it's reasonable to say that it's going to be the small circle uh, I hope it's fair to say that there's small polar or nonpolar. which is to say they're not ionic. So they're small, polar and nonpolar, and they're circles. So that's that would be the answer to that that page. I believe most of there, uh, I think you have <coughs> everything that we've covered in class. All right, uh, using the information in the previous models, circle the correct response fill in each blank diffusion is a net movement of molecules from an area of of, of what to what <clears throat> an area of high to an area of low concentration right the molecules will continue to move along this semi-permeable membrane slash concentration gradient so i hope you know that it's going to move along a concentration gradient it's going to go through the semi-permeable membrane, but it's going to go along the concentration gradient. So high to low along the concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium. All right. Once the equilibrium is reached, the molecules will continue to move across the membrane randomly because they're asking you once the, once the equilibrium is, is reached right and so they're going to move randomly <clears throat> in both directions there's not going to be a net movement of, poly of molecules after e dynamic equilibrium is reached all right so i think that that clearly walked you through what uh diffusion is and hinted towards the idea of osmosis facilitated diffusion now we have that was just moving simple diffusion moving through a membrane, whether it's the diffusion of water or the diffusion of small nonpolar molecules. Regardless, it's the diffusion of water. No help was necessary to get it across. But here we're going to look at facilitated diffusion. Remember, we talked about this in class. Facilitated means getting, needing, or providing help. So facil to facilitate something is to help something. So these particles need help.
to cross the membrane, so they'll tend to be larger ionic, but let's move on. So this is one of those membrane crossing proteins, and these are hormones, and this is glucose. <clears throat> so one hormone might be insulin, right? So this, uh, they don't tell you this, or well, not yet anyways, it, but the hormone that helps glucose get in the cell would be something called you know, insulin. And so insulin would bind to the protein, the, uh, to a site, the membranes. <coughs> one of the many things insulin does, and, and hormones do more than one thing. Uh, there are general signals. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, hormones bind, the insulin binds, it opens up the channel. The channel you see was there. It crossed the membrane. You see it crosses the membrane. It's a membrane crossing protein, a protein. But most of the time it's closed. You know, nothing gets through. But with insulin, in this case, this hormone binds. And now the triangles, the glucose molecule, the large polar molecule can get through the membrane. It's called a gated channel. Right, it's not just a pore. It's not just a, a door that's open, but it's a gate that can be swung open with the right key. The key is the hormone, so the hormone acts as a key. <clears throat> to the gate. Once you open, once the key is present, the door, the gate is open. The door is open, and the molecules can move from. The glucose molecules go from high, which one would think would be, it doesn't necessarily have to be, there are other possibilities, but one would think that this would be the blood, so the sugar would leave the blood and go into the cells, into the tissues, right? So into the muscles, into the brain, well, not the brain really, uh, into the muscles, into the, into the gut, into the into the skin, into any of the cells that need glucose, because all cells need glucose. Which part of the membrane is shown in detail in model three? Uh, <clears throat> the detail, the membrane is a is a is a integral membrane protein or transmembrane protein. Transmembrane. What type of molecule attached to the protein? Hormones. Oh, another, uh, it, maybe we should call it a gated channel. A specific type of transmembrane protein called a gated channel. There's many different kinds. <clears throat> explain in detail what happened to allow the glucose to pass through. And I just said it verbally, but let me go ahead and write it. <coughs> so that it says, uh, or what I wrote was the hormone attached to the protein uh, and changed its shape. See, it was bulged out so that it couldn't, wouldn't allow anything through. Then when it, when the hormone attached to it, the shape changed. Another word for changing its shape is its conformation. Now, this is going to be a key word you'll see repeatedly, so you should get used to it. Conformation. So its conformation changed, or its shape changed. This allowed glucose to cross the membrane as a channel was created. I mean, I should add that. <coughs> so it says some... Uh, molecules such as glucose use gated channels as shown to figure th in model three. However, not all channels are gated. Some channels remain permanently open are used to transport ions and water across the cell. Let's take a look at some of those. To facilitate means to help. Explain why uh, this type of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion. Well, I think that should be obvious, but I'm going to go ahead and, and write out the answer here. So what I wrote was a pro the protein helps the glucose into the cell. It would not be able to cross otherwise. 
Hence the word facilitate. <clears throat> All right. The tails of phospholipids are nonpolar, therefore they do not readily interact with charged particles such as ions. How can the this explain why facilitated fusion is necessary for the transfer such of ions such as sodium and potassium across the mem cell membrane? So if these are nonpolar, the ions, the substance to be transported, can't they can't be uh they can't get through without some kind of channel that is amenable to being able to interact with the ions. All right. So <clears throat> so when you're talking, this uh, these are this is active transport down here, but if you have ions that can't get through the phospholipids, then you need to have a channel to allow them to get through. Now we're going to look at we're going to look at a, a type of facilitated diffusion. Or it's actually not facilitated diffusion; it's active transport. That's going to look at at sodium and potassium, a very distinct and, and important pair of ions that are involved in neurotransmission or the transmission of, of neuronal signals and muscle signal <coughs> muscle contraction. So your your thoughts, your uh, nerve endings, etc. Sending a signal down a neuron. All right, so let's look at active transport. There's a membrane, uh, membrane spanning protein, a protein that goes across the membrane. This is the substance. This diamond is a substance to be transported. It's an ion because it says ion binding. So the ion binds. So there it is. This substance binds. Then we're using ATP. ATP, it is inside the cell. So to be clear, this is outside. This is inside. How do I know? Well, <clears throat> this is ATP binding site. ATP is made inside the cell. So if the ATP binding site is on this side, this must be outside over here, and this is inside. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. We've discussed this before, but instead of writing out adenosine, I'm just going to go and... You know what? Let me. Adenosine triphosphate. And so there's going to be attached to this nitrogenous base, there's going to be not one phosphate, <coughs> but three phosphates. It's going to be key to how the cell works. This is called the cell's currency. No work gets done in the cell without ATP. And in fact, going from ATP to ADP, and we have discussed this in the past, ADP is, this is a TP adenosine triphosphate. This is a DP adenosine diphosphate that releases energy. It allows for work to get done. It allows for movement to happen. Controlled movement. This is extra energy. This isn't just the energy of, of heat. This is not just random kinetic energy. This is chemical energy. So this took effort to make and collect and is used specifically by the cell to get things done. So why do you need energy this is a question <clears throat> to take ions from this side, from outside, and move them in. I hope you can tell. I'll give you a second before I answer. Okay, you need energy because, well, before let me, rather than answering, let me ask you a question. Is this high or low on this side? Is this high or low on this side? Well, I hope you answered that it's higher on this side. So the dim the diamonds, the substances trying to be transported, the ions are lower concentration on this side and higher on this side. 
So we're able to move them across and create a, create a gradient, create a concentration gradient. These are ions, usually negative or I mean, they could be positive or, or they might be negative, uh, but let's go ahead and say positive ions. So this side is now more positive than this side. So when you have, why? Because each one of these, by the way, and the diagram shows these three. This is time passing. I hope you understand that. This is where it starts. This is where it, where, where it ends up. Uh, <clears throat> this is the middle as ATP binds. And then finally, as ATP gets turned into ADP, the energy, the protein changes its shape. The conformational change occurs. And the ions move in or out or whatever is happening. In this case, these ions are moving in. This is a general structure. So each one of these is a different time. So this is time zero. This is time mil 10 milliseconds. This is time 20 milliseconds, whatever it is. Uh, <clears throat> so let me uh, emphasize that by kind of putting a, an arrow this direction, arrow that direction. Or maybe it would be better just to kind of draw a line. Maybe that would help it something like this all right i don't know just to make sure that you understand that this is the beginning this is the middle and this is the end it's not three different proteins it's the same protein at three different times as the ions are showing you moving into the cell <coughs> ultimately this side is positive this side is negative what do we call that when one side when you have a positive side and negative side We've discussed this again in class previously. This is called a battery, all right? We have separated charges. You have an electrical potential. All you need is a difference in charges, concentration of charges. If you have a lot of positives on this side, not a lot of positives on this side, then what you get is a separation of charges, positives and negatives. <clears throat> Which part of the cell membrane is shown in more detail in model four? Well, we... <coughs> Go back to model two if needed. So we're looking at a transmembrane protein. A gated channel. So, a, you know, I mean, you could name it a transmembrane protein. Specifically, a gated channel. What shape represents the, uh, the substance being transported across the membrane? The diamond. In which direction is the transport substance moving from the area of high concentration to low concentration, from the area of low concentration to an area of high concentration? Well, I think it's from low, from low to high. As the number of diamonds attests. Shows. <clears throat> so you start two, and then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven on one side, two on the other. You go from two to seven, zero to seven. So <coughs> seven 
or nine rather. It'll be nine once these two enter this area. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on. Is the substance being moved along down the concent along down the concentration gradient? Justify your answer. So down would be what? What is down? So down means from high to low. This substance is moving from low to high. So it is not Moving down the gradient. In fact, it's moving up. All right. <clears throat> ATP is a type of molecule that can provide energy for biological processes. Explain how energy is being used in Model 4. ATP I see binds to let me pause this and so ATP binds to transmembrane protein. This provides the energy necessary to change the protein shape or conformation. <coughs> What happens to the ATP after it binds to the protein? Oh. So <clears throat> what happens to ATP after it binds to the protein? A phosphate, uh, a phosphate bond to the ATP adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is broken and it becomes ADP. This releases energy. The type of transport shown in, in model four is called active transport, while diffusion and facilitated fusion are passive transport. Now these are very two different processes. Obviously, as we, as we just identified, I think it's obvious anyways. I don't know. Maybe it's not. It active transfers from low to high. And passive transport is from high to low. <coughs> Given the direction and concentration gradient in active tra passive transport examples, explain why active transport requires energy input from the by the cell. The general So in general, <clears throat> the, uh, the general movement of molecules without the use of energy is from high to low. In order to move materials from low to high, let me do, low to high, against the concentration gradient, energy is required. Now, the example that we gave in class is what if you're trying to, what happens when you're trying to roll a ball uphill? It requires energy versus rolling a ball downhill. 
requires very little or no extra input of energy, randomly the ball will roll downhill. Randomly the ball will not move uphill without an input of energy. So <clears throat> that is the thought. Okay. Complete this this type uh this chart requires the input of energy by the cell. Active transport, yes. Diffusion, no. Uh facilitated diffusion, no. The word the word here, the key word here is diffusion. Facil facilitated diffusion just means that Diffusion or the movement of materials randomly down its concentration gradient. Facilitate just means helping it do that. Molecules move along, down the concentration gradient, down, along, or down the concentration, down, down the concentration gradient. No. This is not true in active transport. This is true in diffusion. And in facilitated fusion, yes. Moves molecules up the concentration gradient, yes, for active transport. And no, you need to put energy, which is the key here is that ATP is going to be used. Always involves channel membrane spanning proteins, yes. You have to have the only way to get material across the membrane is to is for the membrane to cross to span the membrane. And that goes for it's not true of diffusion, but it is true of facilitated diffusion. Remember diffusion, simple diffusion is just it goes right through the membrane. Some kind of channel. Molecules pass between the phospholipids. No. In which case, if it, if that was occurring, there would be no need, There would be no way uh, for a, for the cell to be able to push it against the concentration grade in the case of active transport. Yes, that's exactly what happens here in diffusion. And no, facilitated diffusion again. Facilitated means help. What helps proteins, transmembrane proteins, or membrane spanning proteins. <coughs> moves ions like sodium and potassium ion. Active transport, yes. We just looked at that example. Diffusion, yes. In in a different in a different not diffusion. I'm sorry, no, not diffusion. No, facilitated diffusion, yes. Because you need the protein to crop cross it. Ions cannot randomly flow through the membrane because of the nonpolar tails. Moves large molecules, uh, yeah, relatively compared to ions, sure, uh, single ions. Diffusion, no. Remember, small nonpolar, small polar. Uh, facilitated fusion, sure. Moves small nonpolar and polar molecules. Small, no. Not active transport. Uh, yes, because diffusion allows them to go right through the membrane. And again, if they're small, nonpolar, this can occur here. It's unlikely you're going to use energy, but we'll look at, you'll look at this one. This is actually, there's a molecule called aquaporin. This is a great example of, of moving a small nonpolar molecule or polar molecule across the membrane now. Why would that be necessary? Is water so important that sometimes you need to get more water than can randomly uh, diffuse through the membrane? Because diffusion can be somewhat slow, so you open up a gate, allow a lot of water in, or a channel, and channel let a, let a lot of water in. <coughs> All right, let's take a, let's the next slide here. Given the information on the graph, which type of cell transport would be best to move substances into or out of the cell quickly? Justify your answer. So active transports up here refer to uh, rate of transports, how fast, how fast things move. 
active transfer space. Diffusion is pretty consistent as you go up. So the larger the concentration uh, gradient difference, the faster the diffusion happens. So if you have a large, a very high, like let's say, for instance, you have a cell. Let's say you have, you have two cells and one is uh, 10% and 20% and one is 10% and 80% solute of some kind. And if diffusion is going to happen, it's going to happen a lot, a lot faster. It'll happen here quickly, but it'll happen a lot faster, a lot faster in this because of the concentration difference is so large. So larger concentration difference, the faster the rate of diffusion. Facilitate diffusion. Now, the reason this is so fast is because the only limit is the surface area of the cell, as we've discussed in, in the lab. And the concentration, the only two factors you got to worry about, assuming that temperature is, is constant. When you're looking at diffusion, so it's a pretty much the concentration gradient. So if, assuming temperature is constant, the, the concentration gradient, and the cell surface area is constant, then the only thing you're really worried about is is uh, how <clears throat> the concentration difference, how big a concentration difference you have. With facilitated diffusion, you're you're going to get that that in that difference in concentration is gonna is gonna occur. It's gonna make it go faster and faster. But there's a limit. That's why this line kind of plateaus. When you see a line flattening out, starting to decrease its slope and then start to flatten out, there that means that that it's not going any faster. It didn't slow down. It's just the change in the change in the rate of transport is not increasing anymore. So it's 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 plateauing. We call this plateauing or flattening. Which means it's not getting any faster. This makes a lot of sense. And we'll talk about why in a minute. And the fact that active transport is fast, but it it's constant, it doesn't change because of concentration differences. That makes sense. <clears throat> As the question is, given the information graph, which type of cell transfer would be best to move substances into and out of the cell quickly? <coughs> uh, well, active transport is just always fast. According to this chart, right? This chart says it's always fast. Now, I want to explain a little bit of this, the concept behind the chart, even though it's not part of the problem set here. Uh, I think it's it's worth some time to discuss why exactly these charts are the way these lines are the way they are. Uh, graphs are very useful. And really, it's an it's an it's an incredibly important skill to be able to read uh, read these charts. In fact, the College Board often tells us that the biggest problem, and the math department in our school has identified that the biggest problem the students have, and I think this is across the the planet, is reading and interpreting graphs. So in order to, to really think about a graph, you have to think about what, what makes it what makes the difference between diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So as we saw with with diffusion, <clears throat> diffusion is just there's just two factors that you have to consider, and that's the surface area. Assuming assuming temperature and surface area are constant 
right? We're not, we're keeping those, we're controlling those. We're not, we're not changing those. Assume that. Then the difference is the concentration gradient. And the, the, this is how concentrated it is, right? So if we have, as I just saw, as we just saw with diffusion, the, this one's faster. And this was slower. And that's specifically because this surface area and temperature are the same. So the only other thing that's going to impact it is how, how big a concentration difference there is. Okay, that's fair. Now with facilitated diffusion, with facilitated diffusion, you're gonna have the same, the same two cells The same two cells, and maybe you have the same two concentrations, concentration differences. But because it needs help, there's one more limit that you're putting on this cell, and that's the limit that makes it flatline, that makes it go can't go any faster, and that's the number of transmembrane proteins that you have. Because this is going to go, this will go faster than this. So this, this first example is a slow, and let's... This is faster, but this is the same. So this is the same as two. Two is faster than one. And one is the slowest. Well, that's because the concentration gradient difference is, is bigger here. But even though the concentration difference is bigger, right? The, the, this is a steeper hill, okay? You would think it would go faster, but it can't go faster because it needs the channels. If this is this, the number of channels, number of places it can go in is limited by the number of channels, where here, the only thing that limits it is surface area. Here you have the same surface area of the cell, but that surface area is irrelevant because you, it only it can enter, the, this material can only enter the cell th with help with these transmembrane proteins. So that these two have to stay, this, this one, there's going to be a limit, there's going to be a place where, where it limits, they can't go any faster. So when we look at facilitated diffusion, this would be, <clears throat> this would be where we would see number one. So if we look at this one here, let me, let me zoom in here and just say, here is where we might see one. We might see two here, right? But we have a limit, even though the concentration difference is getting bigger and bigger. Here, well, let me see. Let me redo this. Maybe this is two. Three might be a little faster, but not by much because you're limited by how many different transmembrane proteins you have. So when one, two, and three is being considered, you have to consider that there's this, uh, the, it can only get stuff in and out of the cell. It can only move, transport things in and out of the cell through these, these, these integral or transmembrane proteins or membrane-spanning proteins, whatever you want to call them. 
Now, when you're talking about active transport, the concentration difference is irrelevant because remember, the whole point of active transport is you want to move things from low, and that we've saw the examples we saw was where low was outside and high was inside, but it can be reversed as well. Uh, where you have here, you have the the the, the transmembrane protein, but you also are going to need to have uh, you're also going to need to have ATP going to ADP. You're going to need energy, but the key is that you're going to go from low to high. So the concentration difference between them is not going to be impact the rate of this. The only thing that's going to impact how fast this goes is how much ATP you have. As long as ATP is present, as long as there's, there's substrate or binding ions binding it, the concentration uh, difference between the two sides is really relatively, I mean, it's really not going to be a major impact on how fast the movement across the membrane is going to be. So that's why ATP is the fastest and stays, or the active transport is the fastest and stays the fastest uh, because it's not dependent on concentration difference at all on this chart. So remember, this, this graph is looking at concentration difference and how fast it transfers, how f uh, the rate of, of, of uh, transport. <clears throat> All right, so it says, which of the cells would be best to move substances into and out of the cell quickly? Well, if according to this, it would be active transport. But, of course, that's not really the, the, going to be the big concern. There's going to be other factors. Yeah, it's a system, so you have to consider a lot of other factors. Which type of transport would be best if the cell needs to respond to a sudden concentration gradient difference? So you have to think about what the, the – there's a, there's a quick answer you might jump to. It might say active transport, okay, because it's always fast. Okay, that's, that's fair. But it says – you have to think about what this is saying. It's saying the sudden concentration gradient difference, right? So active transport is not going to respond to concentration gradient difference at all. It's fast, but it's always going to be fast. As no, the difference in concentration is irrelevant to active transport. It's only how much ATP it has and how quickly can those proteins change shape to, to get the ions or, or molecules or whatever they are across the membrane. Uh, that's the only thing that's impacting the rate of transport. <clears throat> The concentration uh, of materials present also impacts it, but not not in a sudden change of uh, concentration gradient. That won't be an impact. This active transport would not be a good way of dealing with that. Now, between diffusion and facilitated diffusion, if you had the, the if you had a choice, then the, which would suggest that. The. It would depend, right, on 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 where along this line you're you really are uh, are are where the concentration, how big a concentration difference it is, and and what and as to how much it could increase its transport, uh, its ability to transport across the membrane. Ideally, obviously, diffusion would be the key anywhere beyond this plateau, this flat line. Diffusion would be the best because it can it can keep increasing. It increases with concentration difference, and it's probably the best answer. Diffusion is probably the best answer. Depending on your explanation, I I, I personally feel either diffusion or facilitated diffusion could be a, a good answer, but diffusion diffusion once. Uh, the limit of facilitated diffusion
Jeez, what a mess. Let me just pause and write. Limited facilitated fusion is reached. So we look at, if you look at it, facilitated fusion is much better at dealing concentration grip differences because the channels allow the, uh, the substances to move through the membrane much easier than <clears throat> just simple diffusion. But once you start to reach the limit of those transporting or helper molecules or facilitators, once they're all full and you still have a bigger difference, then diffusion takes over uh, as being better. So right here at this point is going to be where facilitated fusion loses out to diffusion because facilitated fusion would have reached a limit. It can't get any faster, but diffusion can continue to increase its speed of transport. Again, why? Because the molecules, the, the membrane, the transmembrane proteins are full. They can't. It's like being a, okay, so let's imagine you're in a city. In a city, uh, you're in a desert city, no roads, but you're in dune buggies. So you can go anywhere, you're ATVs, you're work, you have ATVs. You have a million, uh, you have a hundred, or let's say a hundred people. And they want to leave this, or let's not say a hundred, that's too small. Let's say 10,000 people. All 10,000 people want to leave. They all have four-wheeled ATVs. There are no roads, so there are no roads. You can just go in any direction, any anywhere, no, no water hazards, nothing like that. It's flat land, desert, so leave. Well, everybody just goes. So quickly leaves the city, no problem. So if this is a city, in this analogy, and you have your city and you have your 10,000 people and you're in a desert. Well, people just go in every direction, wherever they want, as fast as they can, they can leave the limit only limited only by how fast they can they can get their ATVs to go. Now, if this Huh. Give me a second. If the city instead were surrounded by a moat like uh, ancient Paris or uh, like Paris or uh, Chicago, if you had rivers surrounding the city so that you only had a limited number of bridges that would allow you to get across. So if you had this, this uh, river system around the city. Everybody still had the same ATVs. Same ATVs, same number of people all wanting to cross. But now you only had two bridges out of the city. You only had two bridges out of the city. Then you could only get so many people over those bridges at any one time. So now, when there's just a few people, then roads would be very much, much more helpful. You can go faster on a road than you could on desert land, even though it's flat and there's no issues. Because the road is paved. Anybody that's ridden a bicycle knows that. Anybody that's ridden a car knows that. You know, you're off-road. You can only go so fast because you don't want to break an axle or in a case of a bicycle fall, or break, break a wheel. But in, the, in any case, you can go faster on the roads, but only up until the bridges are full. Once you've reached that limit of how many people can get on that bridge at any one time, that's it. Here, with this, in this example, without the roads, sure, you can't go as fast with on, uh, you can't go as fast as you could on a paved road, 
but you can go in every direction and many, many people can go. So at, at after you've reached that limit, the 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 unrestrained movement of diffusion takes is faster than the restrained movement of facilitated diffusion, right? So consider that when you're looking at a graph. A lot, all that came from this graph, and I think it, it really makes uh, shows you how connected this information really is. If you understand the basic fundamentals of exactly what does it mean to, ha to be to be facilitate that's a, a facilitated diffusion, active transport, or diffusion. I think it's. I think you have. Uh, <clears throat> you could have. You had a better chance of understanding this graph in a little more depth. Why would the line representing facilitated diffusion level off as the concentration gets higher, while the line representing diffusion continues to go up? Well, I just explained all that. I think you should be able to write it down at this point. Uh, I'm getting a little tired, and I want to finish this this case study at least. I don't think I'm going to do the AP t uh, this morning. I'm going to have to try this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and go back and reference this and, and write it down. That's a good challenge for you. How do you how do water molecules move in and out of the cell? Well. We call it the diffusion of water, but the diffusion of water is osmosis. So it's a diffusion from high to low, but the diffusion of water is called osmosis. Right? Water accounts for 70% of the human body. If water levels are not regulated and maintained in organisms, the, con in organism, the consequence can be disastrous. Cells and tissues may swell, blood cells burst, the brain may expand so much it, it pushes through the skull, leading to brain damage and death. So what exactly is the process that allows organisms to regulate and maintain their water content? Well, we're going to answer that, I think, in, uh, in, the, in the next pages. But we're going to, again, we're going to say the word osmosis. And we know the rules of osmosis. We went over it. I asked you to write them down. Those were the notes you were supposed to have uploaded a week ago. All right, let's move on.
Something must have stashed their loot someplace quiet. Let's knock some heads and figure out where. Throwing you a little going away party. I suggest 
suggest grenades as parting gifts.
the movement of water in and out of the cells. Now, water molecules are pluses. This is here on the key. This is selectively permeable membrane, so it's a phospholipids and protein. <coughs> and then these are sugar molecules. Now, sugar is not going to get in and out of the cell without help. So as you see here, there's a lot more sugar outside the cell than there is inside. Solution consists of a solute and solvent mixed together. For the solution, model one, identify and provide the symbols. Solute, well, that's easy stuff. Easy peasy, the solute is a circle, and the solvent is a plus. Consider the size of the sugar molecule and the water molecules of one. Which molecules in the diagram model one are, are should be able to select to move through the selected permeable membrane? This kind of references the first activity you had in this in this POJO. So we're going to say the 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 water, right? Consider the arrow the the arrows indicating movement across the membrane. Uh, in which direction are water molecules moving into or out of the cell? I think you can see that that it's mo they're moving in both directions. They're moving out and they're moving in, out, out, in, out. So both are water mo are more water molecules moving into or out of the cell? Well, let's look. I'm going to count out. One, two, three, four out. One, two in. So more out. And then is the net direction movement into or out of the cell? Out. So the net movement is the movement where it's happening more. Remember, net means out. How many going out? How many going in? Net means the difference between the two. It's either out or in. Net is the total. After you subtracted and added everything together, what's the total? That's called the net. Have, uh, total kind of is often <coughs> the sum of, right? Uh, so it's not really adding them together as much as it is adding and subtracting. So that's hence the net. You take into account all the different movements. All right. Circle the correct word below to indicate the change in concentration of the sugar solution on each side of the membrane. So look, sugar can't move in. This is kind of we've, we've discussed this many times before. Sugar can't move in or out, right? So the sugar stuck. There's more water inside than there is outside, concentration-wise. I think you, got, you can count the molecules up and, and create a percentage if you want. Uh, we can do a pie chart. We could do all that. But I just think if you look at it, you see there's more pluses on the inside than there is outside. There's more circles on the outside than there is in. So the water is more concentrated inside than it is outside. That means that water's moving out. That also means that the outside is known as hypertonic. Right? Where the inside is hypotonic. All right, so we know water moves towards the hypertonic side, so we know that water is moving out. Those are kind of the rules that we've come up with already. We've discussed it. We've tested it and written out the notes, done a lab on it. So circle the correct word below to indicate the change in concentration of sugar solution on each side. The solution inside the cell will become more or less concentration inside the cell will become more or less concentrated in the net movement. If the water is moving out, the inside of the cell will become, I'm pausing for effect, will become more concentrated. 
because as you lose water inside, inside becomes more concentrated and the outside becomes less concentrated, less hypertonic. The inside becomes more or less hy hypotonic or more hypertonic, right? So you get more concentration of solute inside, less concentration of solute outside. The number of solute concentrations do not change. The solute number stays the same. It's just you increase the solvent outside as the water moves out more than it moves in. So it's more concentrated inside after a while and less concentrated outside. All right. Applying what you already know about the random movement of water molecules, what will eventually happen to the concentration of both sides of the membrane? They're going to be equal. If possible, I mean, obviously the whole thing could collapse. If it's not possible, then it won't happen. But it will attempt, it, it will attempt to, there will be a tendency to move towards equilibrium. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> the definition of diffusion is movement of water, of molecules across the membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. According to the definition, is the cell in model one undergoing diffusion? Yes. Is as water moves from its high concentration, square brackets mean concentration, to its low square brackets mean concentration concentration uniquely let's call it let's just say this type of diffusion called osmosis. The cell in diagram and cell diagram model one, where is the higher concentration of water inside or outside of the cell? As we discussed, the water concentration is higher inside. The water concentration. Now the concentration of solute, hype, the tonic, is higher outside, but the water concentration. This is this is why this kind of confusing point is why we 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 tend to think of osmosis as something. Try to label osmosis as different. This can be very con confusing, even though it's it's really s pretty s simple. If you break it down and take it one step at a time, it can get very confusing. As we said in class. It's, it can sometimes be confusing, even, even for those of us who know our, our right from our left. Sometimes we turn left instead of right because it can get confusing. Orientation is a problem. Here also, orientation is a problem. Anybody that plays video games knows that this is an issue. All right. Is the cell in Model 1 undergoing diffusion? If you consider the concentration gradient a concentration of water on either side of the selective permal membrane. Well, yeah, yes, as we said earlier, I don't understand why they wouldn't. I, I don't understand why that's different from... I don't understand why that's different from six... Am I misreading something? Let me reread re this. So it's definition, movement, according to the definition of cell model one undergoing diffusion, we said yes, we explained it. And we said inside or outside, higher concentration of water is inside. Is the model one undergoing diffusion if you consider the concentration of water on either side of the selective primal membrane? I said yes. I mean, I don't understand why they did that, but that's fine. 
I'm not I'm not going to explain because I already explained. I'm going to say C number six. Maybe I'm reading something wrong here. Somebody's going to have to correct me when we get together if if that's if I'm misreading that. But osmosis is the movement of water from water high water concentration, low water concentration across the semi permeable membrane. That's what we call the diffusion of water, right? So it is diffusion. It's just of water specifically. So it's going to go from high to low. So as we said earlier in both animal and this is in animal and plants in animals. When high in a hypertonic solution, when it's when it's uh, high sugar, high salt outside, the water is going to move out. But then the cells start to shrink and they get crenated. All right, so they get they get they shrink up. If they get if it crenates enough, they'll die. So we can't we don't want that to happen. We don't want to have be in a hypertonic solution. So water will leave the cell and go into the surrounding area. Now, remember, when we're talking about a, a, a human, when you have cells lining, you know, let me just draw this out really quickly. They're not at all like this, but I'm going to go ahead and just remember something like your blood vessels are made of cells. Everything in your body or most things in your body are made of cells or produced by cells, Right. So these are all cells, and these are cuboidal, but they're not really cuboidal in your bloodstream. Uh, the blood vessels of your body, arteries and, and, and uh, veins, are made of cells. Um, this is a cut, so you have to think about this as kind of being uh, uh, cut out right, of a, of a, of a long blood vessel. And then there's tissues here inside the blood vessel. This is a capillary of some kind. And you have all kinds of, of, of tissues here, muscle or brain or whatever, right? And in here you have, you know, you have blood. And blood is flowing in a, in a direction, you know, away from the heart, uh, in the arteries and towards the heart, in the veins. It's a closed circulatory system what have you. The blood's solvent is water. So if, if water is leaving the cell, leaving, leaving the tissues, because there's high concentration of salt, for instance, if you eat a lot of salt, if you have a lot of sodium chloride in your, in your bloodstream, then the water is going to leave the tissues and go into your blood and what is that going to do? That's going to increase your blood pressure. Why is that increasing blood pressure? Because water's filling in this tube. <coughs> it's like when you turn on this the hose, the spigot on the hose, the more water you let in the hose the more pressure you get going through that that tube, the same thing goes with your arteries and veins. So when you see this water leaving a cell, it's going into the blood or into the tissue. It could be leaving the, uh, leaving the cell and going into your inner, uh, inner interstitial fluids. So you get swelling. So you can get swelling in your, in your that's not actually in your blood vessels, but actually swells in the, swelling in your tissues, the, the spaces in between your tissues, because there's spaces in between, uh, in between your muscle, uh, your major muscles, and they're surrounded by connective tissue, and the water can flow in there and fill those in. We call that swelling. So hypertonic solutions can, uh, or a lot, eating a lot of salt can make you swell up. It can make you, it can give you high blood pressure. That's why that happens. Isotonic, that means you're eating your blood or the surrounding, the surrounding tissues. These are blood cells, it looks like. They're going to have, they're gonna have uh, water moving in and out equally, so you have a well-balanced, normal blood pressure in the case of your blood. But there's, the cells themselves are going to be in normal shape, whatever that shape is. To be clear, different cells, different tissues of different cells have different shapes. And we'll talk a little more about that next week as well. So in a hypotonic solution, if you don't have enough salt, 
then the cells would swell up because inside you have a higher concentration of salt than outside. So water is going to flow in. It'll go, it, it could flow in so much it could actually burst, and we call that lysed. So you have your normal cells. It's a normal concentration of salt on both sides of the cell. You have your crenated cells. It means that there's it's higher salt outside. You're eating a lot of salt, uh, Lay's, potato chips, french fries, what have you. Uh, or you you have low salt, low salt concentrations. Your cells will swell up. The cells will swell up, not the blood, but the cells will swell up and they can actually burst. In a plant cell, <clears throat> Crenated plasma is a hypertonic solution outside. It's the worst thing that can happen for a plant because it has it has a cell wall, and so it's not it's very hard for it to be lysed. It be, it it develops something called Tuger pressure, and it becomes turgid. In other words, it it's it's straight up and down. It's it stands straight up and down versus drooping right so a turgid plant is one where the water is rushing in because there's low salt concentration outside water rushes in if the cell pushes against the cell walls and it stands straight up <coughs> if the cell however it, if there's not if there's a high salt concentration outside, then the water leaves the cell, and the, it's no longer turgid. It's no longer standing straight up. That's why we see them wilt. Wilt. Uh, water leaving the cell is is a bad thing for the plant. Uh, it has a cell wall, so, uh, but it doesn't have anything that's going to stop it from from shrinking up. We call that plasmalized. A normal cell is when the you have an equilibrium on both sides. It's fine. And turgid means it's 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 standing straight up, or or it's it's a uh, it's filled with water. It has a central vacuole that could also fill it with water and keep it functioning. Obviously, plants can't move like like humans can. So if we get in a hypotonic solution, animals will move somewhere, but plants can't move. So the cell wall helps them a great deal. So that's the osmosis and the mood and their impact on cells and in the case of humans, blood pressure and in the case of plants, rigidity, another word uh, for rigidity in plants is turgid. Uh, so that's osmosis and its impact on. Now using your knowledge of cells, which type of cell model two animal and plant have selectively permeable membranes? Well, all cells do. They both have membranes. Plants have cell walls as well. All cells have plasma membranes, have semi-selectively permeable membranes. A permeable, rigid cell wall, plants. Between plants, it's not just plants. It's not just plants. It is not just plants that have a cell wall. But between animal or plant, those are our choices, plants is the answer rigid and the cell wall is permeable so it, it's it's a lot like our agros gel it's it's mainly permeable uh, it's only uh impermeable to very large very large particles so it's pretty much a matrix for structure to help support the plants the arrows in model two show movement of water in and out of the cell what does the thickness of the arrow sh indicate where the larger amount of water is flowing. Thicker equals more. For each question, use diagram A-F model 2, which cells show a net increase in water? Well, that would be C and F. C for the animal cell, F for the, the 
Plant cell C is the, pla uh, the uh, lysed cell because it's increased so much it bursts. F is the turgid plant cell. It increased so much it would have burst except it has a cell wall to hold it together. And that decrease in, in water is A and D. A being the plasma, uh, the creatinated cell, the cell, the animal cell that, that shrunk up to the point where it either died or barely survived. And the other is the, uh, the plant cell, which is the plasmalized cell. No net change is obviously, at least I hope it's obvious, it's, it's B and E. And those are the two normal looking cells. Consider definition of osmosis and net movement of water from a dilute solution, high concentration of water. Now, please pay attention to that. Dilute means high concentration of water to a concentrated solution. So concentrated means a low concentration of water. A, a, high, a concentrated solution means high solute, but that means low concentration of water. Again, that, that orientation problem that I was talking about earlier. Describe the concentration of solution surrounding A and D, extracellular. Extracellular means what? Outside. Relative to the concentration of solution, intracellular. So inside, right? So I already answered this previously, but... You know, just to be clear that what's happening here is that A and D have high, uh, and you can word it in sentences, but I'm just going to outline it here. Again, I'm feeling tired. Um, high solute concentration. So we call that high solute concentration uh, outside. High solute concentration outside <coughs> means water's moving out. All right. All right. Describe. Oh, by the way, the word would be hypertonic. I know they don't ask this, but I just want to keep emphasizing the vocabulary words as we move along. Describe the constitution of extracellular solutions C and F relative to the extracellular, uh, uh, relative to the intracellular solution C and F. So again, uh, with C and F uh, inside. Intracellular, inter, inside, intra, inter, I'm oh, sorry, intracellular concentration is high and outside. is low. Describe the concentration of extracellular solution in B and E. And by the way, again, just to emphasize this, this is hypotonic. The solution <coughs> outside is hypotonic. Outside is hypertonic.
again, they they want to know the extracellular solution, right? In this case, it's going to be. In this case, it's going to be hypotonic. And the previous case, it was hypertonic. Right? And describe the concentration of extracellular solution B and E relative to the concentration of uh, intracellular. Well, again. Again, this is, they are the same. And we would call that isotonic. Both sides are the same. Using the diagrams of Model 2 and the answer to the previous question, develop definitions for the following words. Hypertonic and extracellular solution is higher concentration of solutes, lower concentration of water. Hypotonic, lower concentration of solutes, higher concentration of water, isotonic, <clears throat> equal concentration of solutes on both sides. Consider model, cell models in two that are hypertonic solutions. Consider the cell models in model two that are hypertonic solutions. Describe what happened to the plant cell. Water left. The pressure created by the water pushing against the cell wall decreased. All right. What word is used to summarize these changes in a plant cell? Plasmalized. What word we use if the cell were an animal cell? Crenated. Consider the cells in model two that are hypotonic solutions. Describe the changes of the plant cell. Water moved in and increased the pressure. on the cell wall. From the inside. Word summarize the changes of the plant cell. Turgid. What word would be used at the cell word animal cell? Lyst. Oh, sorry. Lyst. When animal cells are hypotonic solution, they undergo lysis. However, plant cell does not. They only become turgid. Define lysis based on the diagram. 
burst. <coughs> what structure on the on the plant cell prevents lysis from occurring in the hypotonic solution? Cell wall. All right, so that's it. We're done uh, with the honors biology stuff. Everything here, there were a few vocabulary words that perhaps, maybe two vocabulary words that might have been introduced, but I don't think, I do remember talking about them, but not emphasizing them. Um, But there's, it should have been pretty straightforward. However, if you had any issues, I hope this helps. Uh, Make sure you have the right answers written in the document that you've turned in. Uh, AP kids, I will uh, finish this this afternoon and upload your AP version. Okay.